For many, the theme of advanced locomotions has a flair of something arcane, something that exists in the later stages of polishing the game, or as a separate mechanic, or even doesn't exist at all. Different vaults, climbs, wall running, ledge actions, glides, all these things, for some reason, are deemed to be something different from a simple WSD plus jump locomotion package. Today, as a starting point, I'm going to destroy this opinion about some animations being more advanced than others. Welcome to the parkour series. Also, as always, this video exists due to my unending motivation, and it persists thanks to you, my wonderful patrons. From the fundamentals, input in general, most of the time, is a contextual thing. Any movement technique is a way to interact with the environment of a game level location. They can't exist, and they can't be analyzed without the location around, and any movement technique always has a contextual triggers, or clauses, to work. So the complex problem of parkour has a natural border to split it into two tasks, when and how. This actually is the reason of arcane aura of wall runs and edge grabs. WSD and jump standard package as any movement has a when component, but WSD's when is just a default character state of being on the floor, where most characters spend 90% of their time, and jumps when is when button is pressed and character is on the floor. And these trigger functions themselves are so commonly used that they are actually provided by the engine out of the box with character body class. This means that WSD and jumps do use some area awareness, but it is so simple and default that people just skip being conscious about it. Naturally, before we can start to implement any movement technique, we first need to think through its area awareness model, its context, its triggers, and, in general, how we integrate area awareness into our execution flow. Because for simple platformers, our area awareness is existing in its proto-state, probably in the form of if statement, but that approach doesn't scale very well and is hard to reproduce when you suddenly have like 15 possible movement modes, some of which can be enabled simultaneously. Integration is king. So so, area awareness. Area awareness algorithms can be divided into two big groups – static awareness and dynamic awareness. Static awareness generally is more performant, more precise and easier to implement for the programmer. A super typical example for static awareness is an interactable chair. So you have a chair smash, you have some box collider attached to it, and to be interactable you have some collision area like this, for example. If the character is inside this area and looks at the chair, you can press interaction button and sit down. These approaches work best for, quote, environmental buttons, like chairs, roads, souls-like style doors, etc. Dynamic area awareness describes a setup where the character has a very smart model installed in it that has ways to dynamically access information about the world around. For example, the super basic algorithm to find an edge is to fire two ray casts, one forward and one vertical, with a twist of the second ray will be fired from the same height or from the same distance where the first one collided. Dynamical area awareness Awareness is generally more taxing on your performance, demands sometimes pretty creative solutions from the programmer, and is not easy to install. But if installed, what it does for you is it frees the human that provides you the location from the task of marking it down with things. This gives you some freedom, because now, for example, the level designer doesn't need to do any extra work aside from providing you actual models and collision objects behind them to create a level for your game. So in theory, the story about installing a dynamic area awareness model is a classic story about investing time and effort for you to be less dependent on other system components later. But this is not the whole story. It's not a scale or a spectra where manual markdown is easy, fast and not scalable, and dynamic awareness is difficult, slower but ultimately more scalable. It is actually more of a bell curve. Our axis is how simple our situation is and how smart and scalable we need our system to be. The perfect illustration for this is a classical task of edge detection. So imagine we have a lot of cavern crawling in our game and we want our player to be able to climb onto small cliffs. If the player stands right before the cliff, looks at it and presses the jump button, we don't jump and instead we hang onto the cliff and pull ourselves up. The laziest solution to this is to have a small collision pane, like a thin invisible aquarium that will be installed before the cliff. If the character is colliding with this area, its jump events are being mapped to hang and pull up action instead of jump action. 
The Manus, though, is now we sort of bound by a necessity to install this aquarium before any climbable cliff in our game. Someone needs to do it, either the level designer or some developer, and this isn't a very rewarding task and can clutter things. So for a game like Witcher 3, it was probably done. The game has some number of these cliffs, but they are rare, always painted with white paint for some reason and are static and equal. Simple problem, no frequent occurrences, simple solution. However, if Witcher 3 probably has under a thousand of these white painted cliffs, and in all other aspects it's not a game about climbing, there are other examples. This product on the screen is called New World, and it is the game about covering huge land masses walking on your legs. Look at this cliff wall, every single edge that you can put yourself against here will invoke that pulling up animation, and on this wall alone there are probably about 50 to 100 places where you can pull up, and well, it's just a wall on a several hectares map. So obviously there is not a chance someone went through set up in a collision area before any climbable cliff. Because of some secondary symptoms like cringe interactions on a number of smaller cliffs, characters ability to pull up even in strange places and even in places where players weren't actually anticipated by devs to be in, I have an opinion that New World uses dynamic ledge detection mechanisms. And it definitely pays off for a map that huge, because character controller with an ability to pull up is created once, and then it can be put in literally any map environment, while location designer has nothing to do with marking the location down, they just draw this cliffed wall, throw it into the game and let players explore what they can climb and what not. Typically, the discussion ends here, especially for an indie and or simple tutorials environment. But let's be honest, dynamic area awareness can be a pain in the ass. This bell actually has the second tail, the worst situation of high quality precision need. It is easy to write a ledge detection algorithm on two ray casts, but this method is always illustrated in an innocent environment of perfectly square accurate cliffs to climb. But what if our cliff has this shape? Ah, certainly this is the ledge, am I right? <laughs> Both recast orders give you the wrong answer. To make things even more nightmarish, let's increase the workload. Imagine that now not only we want to pull up, we want to hang onto the ledge and being able to traverse it left and right. And because we here want to have a AAA feel, we want our hands to be IK'd to the appropriate parts on the ledge. Again, hands IK targets can be shamaned into existence with some rays, but what if my ledge has this form? Yeah. Teaching your machine to properly process the whole space of random cases can cause suicidal thoughts. But static level awareness? Well, that approach kills the task with a finger snap easiness. Just mark the ledge border with some 3D curve or with colored seams on the model, and voila, your dynamic hands IK target can be sampled from this path 3D in one function called that takes the arm length as an argument. So don't sleep on static awareness, it has some insane use cases even for the most intricate of tasks. The real conclusion I want to draw is, as always, no architecture choice is black and white, it's all gradients of grey. Don't listen to me, think for yourself and always ask the core question, what solution will cause more pain in the ass later in my concrete case? The second important conclusion I want to put into your head is that static and dynamic awareness mechanisms do not interfere if integrated properly. In the ideal world, as soon as my input command jumping was mapped to a pull-up action instead of jump action, my system doesn't give a flying fuck about how this mapping was produced by area awareness model. It means that in said ideal world, my system views area awareness as a single entity with a simple and universal interface. And inside that model, I can use both dynamic awareness pieces and static awareness pieces however I would like, until I can integrate it universally and provide a needed mapping, the world is my oyster. The next question is how to integrate the area awareness layer into your game logic. Well, your character is a state machine even if it isn't written as one. Every frame you read inputs, process them, define current state and then update it in a way your current state wants. Whatever architecture you use, area awareness needs to do its job after input gathering, but before any game logic about your state's transitions. But ultimately I won't pretend for long, this project is built on top of my controller project videos. To understand me word for word, you will need to watch an hour of very nice videos here. To somewhat understand me, you can watch first 6 minutes of this video, it's a compressed version. 
Let's first dust off our understanding of move transition logic flow. We have a list of inputs from the input actions. In the most vanilla version, they are translated into move names, then sorted by priority of these moves, and then the move with the highest priority is chosen. Now I want to touch the subject that, as it seems, confused a lot of people. I gather my input into this data transfer object. At this stage, these strings are input action names, like literally a name of a button on or input access. Then I give this DTO to my model, and at this point, these strings stop being input action names, they start to be moves names. I just don't store them in different collection to save three lines of code and the field creation, honestly. But the fact that here my sprint input action has the same string name as this sprint move is just a kind incidents. Now, remember when we created our combat system, we stumbled upon a problem that our input action names can be forwarded as is and needed mapping. The time I immediately switched to having a separate collection for them and translated them there. And this is sort of what we need to do now for our movement actions. The moment we have a grabbable ledge, our movement buttons lose their quotes single definition status and also need to be translated. So I created another array to hold them, and this time I will refactor the system to better differentiate input actions from the move names. Earlier we had run, sprint and jump input actions, and now they became move, move fast and go up actions. But here an unfortunate realization awaits us. When we were designing the combat system, the layer itself was created very thin, and we were able to find an important abstraction of weapon that really does map our input actions into attack names. But what can you actually do with movement actions? There is no single abstraction for such processing. Let's again imagine a ledge that we want to grab. So we were idle or running, and before the cliff we want to search for the ledge in approximately this area. And if it's there and the jump button is pressed, we pull up. Hmm, okay, but now we found an unusually nice animation that jumps onto a ledge from sprinting state. We want this animation badly, but it takes us several meters forward and up. Not only the climb move is different, but the search bound for the ledge are different also. Hmm, different triggers and different transitions. It leads me to the conclusion that locomotion actions need to be translated per state, and we can just delegate this job to some other layer or abstraction. However, the context coin has another side. Some context is forced. For example, we cannot have a floor under our feet, or we can be in water, or in a thick swamp, or on a walkable cable or rope. Some context transpires being a per state phenomena and is just a universal truth. That context I don't want to be a per state code, because in that case it's just a bunch of code duplication. That context I want to be added in one place. Moreover, sometimes it might not be an easy task. Dynamic area awareness tends to quickly grow in volume, because let's be honest, you spam raycasts, and to do it you need at least 5 strings per raycasting. So this work I would stash in one area awareness layer. Here it is. So I added one extra line into the main cycle. It takes an input package and adds the universal context. Currently we have two quotes special areas in our game, being in the air and being on a walkable ledge. I have experimented with adding this in the form of enumeration, but as our machine works with an array of strings, I ended up just adding another move name into the list. On one hand, of course, I gravitate to having an enumeration, on the other hand, working directly with the mechanic the system is already using allows us to go for some nice refactorings. For example, if you watched my controller series earlier, you remember that I had this construction in many states, because well, not having a floor to stand is a pretty interrupting situation. Now I can safely delete these checks and just have one such check in this area awareness layer that just adds a midair move code to the list. And then if any move respects being able to fall, it just falls automatically. The scanning for these special areas currently is done via recasting down. It also gives me ability to introduce quotes two tiers of falling. Earlier I defined my relations with gravity in a binary way, either I am on the floor 
floor or not. Now I have a third variant. In my floor, locomotion states when my legs are not on the floor, but not more than 20 centimeters above. I don't transition to the midair, instead I just fall on the ground inside this locomotion state. Moreover, if you want, you can actually fall faster than gravity if you wish. You can look at it as an analog to snapping to stairs when going down. This will help us to not transition into this goofy fall animation if stumble upon small rocks, steps, etc. It also solves our problem with cyclical fall stutters from the past. After that step of adding context, we need to translate inputs into move names, and as we discussed, we do it per state, so we need to have it here somewhere. I decided to have it in the form of method that I called before my transition logic. We then of course have a super duper default implementation that essentially maps our inputs to the state of things when we didn't even touch them. Move to run, move fast to sprint and go up to jump. It covers most of the simpler side states, but I can override the method whenever I want, for example I redefine it for sprint, changing mapping for go up action into sprint jumping. With this base we are able to explore options. As discussed earlier, all advanced locomotion has one formula. If some geometry factors are present and a certain input pressed, do the unusual thing. If not, do the usual thing or do nothing. For example, in my midair state we can check geometry to tell if we are near a wall and if so, we map otherwise ignored action go up to the wall jump move name. We can as well use our pre-existed class for complex contextual mapping, the combo class. For example, this is a huge combo that can fuel many transitions. With it, we check if we are near a climbable edge. If so, we map our go up action, otherwise interpreted as jump to the climb up action. Today's portion of me actually is over, people who wonder why do I already have a lot to show but don't actually show it, check the description and the pinned comment. Also, please like and subscribe because